started so let me uh, just summarize where we were last time and then please ask your questions so we spent quite a bit of time just looking at uh, the Schrodinger boson theory of an antiferromagnet on the square lattice uh, formally that's a theory of a one over n expansion of an sun antiferromagnet so we went through uh, very standard theoretical methods of finding saddle points and different types of saddle points and tunneling between saddle points. Uh, and when and then we encapsulated all that in a, in a very simple Hamiltonian. So this is sort of in the spirit of an RG procedure, but where we're integrating our some degrees of freedom, but we're not rescaling the lattice. We still have to keep the original lattice uh, alive. Uh, but we are, uh, you know, got rid of these spin-on excitations or the e-particle excitations, uh, and now we have a theory of, uh, uh, which basically is a theory of the m-particles alone, uh, and that's extremely important because it's the existence of the m-particles that uh, defines the stability of the phase we're interested in, which is the, uh, uh, which is the phase with, you know, fractionalized charges. So this is the theory. It's the sometimes called Z2 gauge theory or an Ising gauge theory. Uh, this was introduced actually early on, no, earlier than even I remember, in 1971 by Franz Wegener. Um, and the title of his paper was Phase Transitions uh, in Spin Models Without an Order Parameter. So he put his finger on one of the most important uh, features here uh, that we're going to see in this model a confinement transition where we go from the spin liquid phase to a more conventional phase uh, and there is no local order parameter that you can measure uh, to uh, uh, to tell you which phase you're in. You have to look at more global properties. Uh, in fact, Wegener also introduced a way of detecting which phase you're in, uh, which I won't say much about, although there's a little bit of the notes uh, because it's not as useful as many other characterizations. Uh, and this is, he introduced what's now called the Wilson loop. Uh, having an area law versus a perimeter law was also something he recognized. Uh, although we attribute that to Wilson, I mean, Wilson did something very similar, um, but for a continuous group, not for a discrete group, like SU3 for quantum thermodynamics. Uh, all right. So, so this particular, this here's the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonians acting the degrees of freedom are qubits, uh, which lives on the links of a lattice. Now, the way I derived it, this is really should be on a triangular lattice. But once you got to this form, I can define it with any lattice. And simply to make it easier to draw pictures, I'm using a square lattice. But almost everything I'm going to talk about can be applied to the triangle lattice today. Um, so there's a qubit on each link of the lattice, and the notation here is that L labels the links, whereas I and J will label the sites uh, of the lattice. So each link belongs to uh, a plaquette. <coughs> That's what this square represents. Um, and each link has two sites on it. So for example, here, there are these objects I define on each side of the lattice, <coughs> and it's the product of sigma x on these four links. Uh, which end on the site I. And it's easy to verify that uh, the Hamiltonian commutes with all of these, uh, these gate charters. <laughs> That's the reason the symbol G. Um, and, and this is the version of Gauss's law. This is telling you uh, that del dot E commutes with the Hamiltonian of electrodynamics. Uh, but this product here is something like a divergence in a continuous great group. Um, and so, so since it's a version of Gauss's law, and it also commutes to the Hamiltonian, uh, we have to specify what the value of this is. There's a separate Hilbert space for each possible value of GI. So we're going to be uh, restricting ourselves to a sector, and this is, in some, some sense, a new part, which Wagner and Wilson didn't have, uh, which is we're going to restrict ourselves to uh, GI equals either plus one or minus one, depending on the spin of the antiferromagnet. So the most important case, of course, is spin a half, 
uh, where this is minus one. And we'll see today that uh, that actually does also make very significant differences to the structure of this theory. Okay, so this is an operator. Sometimes I'll be using the operators. Let me just emphasize that. And this is a constraint. So this is a statement that we're only interested in states where G hat acting on that state is exactly equal to H. All of the states we don't worry about and not part of uh, relevant to the original system. Okay, and, and today we'll also see, I'll give you a physical, much more physical interpretation of what these things are, what these uh, qubits are uh, in terms of the underlying magnet. Okay, questions? Anybody in India, can you hear me there? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, go ahead online. Yes, please. No, uh, yeah, so there was a question regarding how many of these operators GI do you need? Do you, well, the... I want to pick everyone that commutes to the Hamiltonian. And so in fact, there's a GI for every lattice site. And right and now I'm considering an infinite system. And is it necessary to have at every plaquette a GI for this to work? It's on every site. The GI is defined on the site. Huh? Um, yeah, so it's a gauge theory. And in every gauge theory, uh, there's a local symmetry. In this case, it's the symmetry of rotation by 180 degrees about the x-axis. Uh, and that symmetry is generated by G. So. By definition, a gauge theory has a local symmetry, and this is just the generator of that symmetry. So the one defined for every lattice set. Uh, and even the products of, so the, if you ask for what are the complete set of operators that commute with the Hamiltonian, uh, there's all the GI, and there's also the products of the GI, uh, but we don't think of that as we, we, you know, at least on the infinite plane, yes. So any anytime you write down a lattice gauge theory, uh, you will have some operator like this which commutes with Hamiltonian. I can, you know, I can even expand this Hamiltonian to include the Schwinger bosons, to include the spin-ons. And those spin-ons also carry a, a gate charge. And then I would have to change the definition of GI and I still have some other operator with the views with a full Hamiltonian with no approximations. Yeah. Uh, there's one question here, then I'll turn to you. Yes. When you say the lattice isn't bipartite, it's really your ansatz for the cues that wasn't bipartite. Correct. Thank you. That's right. That's what I meant. Yeah. So, yeah, non bipartite ansatz. Okay. Let's see. So, in, in, in fact, you, you could imagine an actual square lattice. Um, having the structure, you would probably need bonds on the diagonals, and correspondingly, there'll be more complicated terms here, but yes. Okay, uh, there was another question online. No, no, there was no question, thanks. Oh, okay, someone else, maybe? All right, so today we're going to, uh, after having made the statement of this problem, uh, we're not going to worry about where this came from too much, uh, and just study this problem for its own merit. Uh, and uh, it's something we can make a lot of progress with uh, because now we have a dimensionless parameter, uh, which is the ratio of G over K. Uh, and we can essentially exactly solve this in both limits when G goes to zero or G goes to infinity. So we can look at both limits. Oh, but before I do that, one more thing I should say in this connection to the large N antiferromagnet, uh, what are these couplings? And how did they, how do they depend on N? So K is basically, as you'll see in a few minutes, two uh, K is the uh, energy gap to create an M particle. So you can just go back to the original theory, look at the M particle saddle point and work out its energy, uh, and that's going to equal to K. So two K equals energy of, uh, gap of an M particle. Um, and this will be of order N in, in the larger limit. And what's G? Well, G was uh, a tunneling event that uh, moved an M particle by one side because you flipped the value of Q on one bond. 
so that has some complicated action for the tunneling event. It's an instant on. Uh, and so G really is about an E to the minus some number times that. So the larger limit G is much smaller than K. Uh, and so when you take that larger limit, you're biasing yourself to a particular region of the phase diagram. Of course, in real life, you're not interested in the larger limit. You're interested in N equals two, uh, the smallest possible value. And then, you know, it's hard to tell which is more important. So we really should study this model at all values of G over K, and that will give us some understanding uh, of the limits uh, and the applicability of the larger theory. So that's why this is, in a way, is much more powerful. Okay, so now let's just go ahead here. All right, so the first limit we want to study uh, is g, small g. But that we can already see from the larger limit, that's the, that's the limit where you're going to have a topological phase or spin liquid. Uh, but this theory will also tell us how the spin liquid gets destroyed or if it gets destroyed. That's, a, that's the confinement run this. So we're going to just look at the ground states uh, for g goes to zero. Okay, so if G is exactly zero, uh, then it's easy to see what the ground state is. You can just write it down. Uh, so one ground state uh, is all spins up. So product on I uh, of all spins up. Um, that, you know, so then every K term on every plaquette uh, is positive. Uh, and therefore you get a mic, I'm assuming K is positive also. So I'll get a minus K for every plaquette, and that's the lowest energy state. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, but you can already see this is, uh, there's some trouble here because this state is not in the Hilbert space where GI equals plus or minus equals eta. Because I've hit the operator GI on this state, uh, what am I going to do? Um, I'm going to say hit the GI on this, this site, uh, on this state, then these spins would go down then. The sigma X operator is going to flip them and all the others would be up. So it's obviously not an eigenstate of the G operator. And so on. So this is the state uh, GI acting on all spins up. On, on a given side i, on this side i. All right, so that's not good enough. What it turns out is very easy to fix this. Uh, we can just fix this by using the fact that the g's commute with each other. Uh, I can write the following state. I will take product on i of, of one plus eta times g i on every side. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe I think it may be clear to write it in two steps, sorry. But let me define the state zero, or let this all spins up. I want to define that to be the state, uh, product of i, i, and then my ground state, product on i, one plus eta, eta is a number, plus or minus one, gi acting on all spins up. Just, just the terminology? Yeah. Oh, this is, I call it the ground state. Uh, I don't know, g, little g. No, there's another little g. Uh, what shall I call it? Zero. Zero, okay. <laughs> yeah. Is it better to label that product over i for the old up state to be product over l maybe? Thank you. Well, that's why I was getting confused. <laughs> yes, there seemed to be too many eyes. It didn't make sense. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. So now this state, uh, what does this do? So if I look at this state here, where I flip uh, the spins, uh, you say that you see that this is also a perfectly valid state because the flux, the product of sigma z around any plaquette is still plus one. Because if I look at this loop, 
there's an even number of downspins. So it's two plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, and so on. So this is also a perfectly valid uh, ground state of that Hamiltonian. So what we have to do is take some linear combination of all these states, uh, which is uh, which all of which have the same energy, but which are also eigenstates of GI. Okay, and I claim this is the answer. Uh, it's very easy to check now that uh, GI on a given I, let me call it G sub J, acting on zero uh, is just eta times zero. So you can easily check this because all the GIs come in with each other and GI squared uh, is equal to one. So, so this state, this is the correct state. Um, every term in this expansion uh, still has the same, it's an eigenstate of the first term with exactly the same energy. Um, because you get a plus one on the product of sigma z on every plaquette. Uh, and it's also an eigenstate of g sub j. Okay, so that's our, and it's essentially the, uh, in the infinite lattice, it's the unique state. Uh, that's the ground state which satisfies this constraint. But let me now draw, it's tedious to draw all these ups and downs all the time. Let me draw this in a different way. Uh, let me just label uh, the downspins and forget about the upspins. Uh, and the downspins are on these four sides. And I'm going to draw them and connect them uh, in this yellow loop. Okay, so now I can forget the rest of the picture. Uh, all the upspins and downspins are gone. And I just have one loop. Okay. So now you can see what this means. Uh, this is equal to uh, the following term. Uh, in terms of pictures, it's sum over closed loops, all closed loops um, of states like that. So you have some, here's our lattice, and you have a bunch of loops of any shape you want, and so on. So you take all possible loops. Each, each loop configuration corresponds to spin, uh, uh, spin configuration, uh, and you sum over all of them. And that's the ground state of this model at G goes to zero with this constraint that uh, capital G is equal to plus or minus one. Okay. Everyone see that? So basically, you, you know, every, every such configuration corresponds to a state where you're putting down spins here. And as long as you're putting in closed loops, uh, your uh, every one of those states has the same eigen energy uh, when when acted upon by the first term in the Hamiltonian. All right, uh, so something's oh my gosh, uh, my video is offline. Can you see me? Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I can't see you, but you can hear me also, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. All right, so I, I presume that everything's going all right. Uh, yeah. Something is happening yeah, over there. The Blackboard is concerned, we are doing fine. We can see everything. Okay, hi, thanks, Kira. Uh Yeah, I can see you now. Yeah. Can you see the dependence on theta in this presentation? Um, so right now, eta doesn't make much much of a difference, but I'm just I'm I'm just making sure the constraint is satisfied. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, so the eta uh, is going to give a phase factor here. Okay, that's Thank you. Different. Right. Uh, so this will be, there'll be a factor of eta for each closed loop. So the eta to the power of the number of loops, a number of plaquettes enclosed. Thank you. Yes. So when I, when I take this factor of GI, I pick up a factor of eta. So every time I put a GI, I pick up a factor of eta. So there's a factor of eta for every closed loop here. For every plaquette inside here, there's a factor of eta. So it's a slightly different combination of closed loops with this extra phase factor. Thank you. That's certainly very important. Uh, but anyway, okay. All right. So this interpretation also now makes a very clear connection 
uh, to the RVB picture. Because you remember the resonating Reynolds bond wave function, which I told you were sum of an infinite number of terms like this uh, of different uh, dimer configurations of square lattice. And a set of different dimer configurations is actually in one to one correspondence with a set of uh, uh, closed loops uh, by the following uh, uh, correspondence, which I'll now illustrate, uh, which is that uh, dimer packings. Or, or the closed loops uh, of what's called the, uh, the transition graphs of diamond packings. Okay, that's just a simple geometric fact. Uh, I hope I got it right. And this, and this way you can see this is the following. Um, let's do it over here. So if I pick, um, so here's my square lattice say, and I pick a reference time of packing. So I just pick a reference packing, anything you want. So the, the obvious one is to just pick this one. So, so by a diamond packing, I mean uh, occupation of the links of the lattice so that every site has exactly one link associated with it. Okay. Uh, so this is one diamond packing, but they, I can give you, you can give me some other diamond packing, uh, which, which I will write down uh, in a different color. Sorry, diamond packing means that the, the two spins are in a nice two spin set. Yes, okay, that would be the interpretation, correct. But right now I'm just making a, uh, a mathematical statement that the set of all closed loops is one to one correspondence to the set of all dimer packings. Okay. Uh, You're only allowing dimers if they're nearest neighbors. Yes, yes. Nearest neighbor dimers uh, and only one dimer per site. So here's one dimer packing, but I take another dimer packing, which I'll draw in green, uh, something like this. This is, for example, okay, so now you can see that every site has exactly either one, both one orange dimer uh, and one green dimer, okay? And then if you look at the, the group two colors together, I have a set of closed loops. So once you pick a reference packing, there's a transition graph to any other packing, and that defines a set of closed loops. And that includes the, the trivial, uh, well, okay, they could be parts where nothing go, where the orange and green are on the same side, and you just remove that. There's nothing happens there. Right. All right, and then to Juan's point, and so now we can see the connection to RVB. Uh, RVB is exactly uh, where you identify. Identify the timer uh, with uh, a singlet of the electrons of the original spins. So up, down, minus down, up. So this was the original answer then of Anderson. You know, I wrote down a few lectures ago someone timer packings with some coefficient CD. Uh, and, and then you had some dynamo covering of the lattice. And on the statement here is that this is actually exactly the same wave function, uh, where even these CD are determined at least as G equals to zero. And we can look at corrections to it. Okay. And so you can also now have an interpretation of what these operators are. Uh, and this has become even clearer soon. Uh, sigma X, Right here, sigma x plus one over two, this operator is the same as a dimer number operator. Okay, so I, if I take this particular operator and act on it on some state, my Hilbert space, uh, 
well, this has eigen sigma x has eigenvalues plus or minus one. So this operator will have eigenvalues zero or one. And so now my claim is if this operator has eigenvalues zero, there's no dimer, there's no spin singlet. If there is a eigenvalue plus one, then there is a spin singlet. Uh, and you can see this from the pictures I've drawn and the action of these two terms. So for example, if I look at this term, you know, what does this do? Uh, the sigma Z, if, if I think of sigma X as a dimer number operator, then this term, you know, basically has a resonance around the protect. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. So if I just take four sides. Um, and let's say that sigma x here equals one, uh, sigma x uh, minus one, sigma x equals one, sigma x equals minus one. So that means there's a, when it's plus one, there's a dimer. So I, I draw a dimer there and dimer here. And then I act on it with sigma z. I'm going to cause the transition to the other one. Uh, which will be this configuration. So then I'll flip the signs. Uh, so let me put that in orange. Uh, so this becomes plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one. I'm going to get these, these points. So the, the sigma z will flip the sign of sigma x. Uh, and I'll go from the green dimers to the orange dimers. Uh, and so the action of the first term gives a factor of k. And it takes you from, as if you wish, the reference graph to the, uh, to the other graph, and you get a closed loop coming from the first term. Okay. So, the, so one confusing thing is here, there's often a tendency to think that sigma z is the diamond number operator. No, it's because we have to do this transition, it's sigma x as the diamond number operator. And you can now also see what's the meaning of this constraint. Uh, the product, you know, gi, equals eta. Uh, well, gi is the parity. Uh, it's the parity dimer numbers on a site. I may have made some wrong statements here. Uh, it's also possible to get a state, but those are, that's a very high energy state. Uh, to get a state where you have four dimers on the same side, that's also a lot, or three dimers on a side, that's a lot, but it's not in the, in the low energy subspace filter scenario. Okay, uh, so that's great. We seem to have uh, recovered, we have, we have, you know, the very simple starting point seems to come out here uh, in just by looking at the eigenstates of this uh, K operator. Uh, along with the gauge constraint. Okay, uh, now let's also do this question. Yeah. Mind us, which operator did you diagonalize every point? So here you diagonalize sigma x. Yes. And I thought that earlier these arrows meant that you diagonalize sigma z. Uh, which, yes, so this is a different basis. Right, so this is exactly the point I just made. I could have drawn the up and down spins. That's not a basis of the dimer basis. You couldn't, you cannot relate the up and down spins to the dimer basis. The way I related the up and down spins to the dimer basis is I referred, I, I wrote them in a set of closed loops, and then I interpreted the closed loop as a transition graph from one dimer topic to the other. Okay. And what that interpretation implies uh, is, in fact, the dimers themselves um, are in the x basis because it's is their quantum numbers are changed when we apply uh, the sigma z operators on them. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's the slightly confusing point uh, and that it takes a little while to sink in. But this, what this picture implies uh, is that the x basis operators uh, that are the dimer numbers. And the q operators are not the dimer number operators. This is also clear from 
our earlier definition. The Q operators uh, were epsilon alpha beta, uh, you know, SI alpha, SJ beta. So this is not a Daimler number operator, the Daimler annihilation operator. And the Q operators are like the sigma Z. So the sigma Z is annihilate a Daimler because it flipped sigma X from plus one to minus one. And the sigma X operators uh, are the one that measure the number of Daimlers. They don't, that would be like Q dagger Q, if you wish. <laughs> okay. Just annihilate or annihilate or create? They can do both, right? This is a real particle. Right, since when Q initially was complex, then Q star would create. But since we have uh, gotten rid of the phase of Q uh, last time, and then it's really a real particle and it has both. Yeah. So there's only, yeah, there's a diver number sigma X and you can flip it uh, either way. You can remove or add uh, a diver by the sigma Z operator. Okay. Right, and, and this somewhat contrary to identification has everything to do with this picture. <laughs> okay, uh, so now let's, before turning to the G goes to infinity limit, uh, let's also look at this on a torus, uh, just so that you fully characterize uh, this thing. Now, I, I get, it goes without saying that you can now, of course, do perturbation theory in G. Uh, and I'll leave most of that to an exercise. There'll be some homework problems on doing perturbation theory in G to correcting the energy in powers of G. It's a relatively straightforward exercise uh, in perturbation theory of quantum mechanics uh, and some combinatorics that you have to work out. Uh, but, you know, you could keep, I think it's probably worked out to rather high order in G uh, somewhere in the literature. Uh, we'll also look at excited states in a bit. But let's continue the discussion of ground states for now. Uh, so we'll look at the ground state at small g on the torus, and then go to very large g and look at the ground states there too. Okay, so now we're going to go on a torus, do exactly the same thing. So the state I've written down is a perfect to go to the eigenstate on the torus, uh, but there's others. So you put the system on a torus, and now we are on a torus with periodic boundary conditions in both directions. Uh, I just draw it as a plane uh, here uh, with the understanding that you know, this edge is identified with this edge, uh, and this edge is identified with that edge. Okay. All right, so I told you that the GI exhaust generated all possible conservation laws of the Hamiltonian. All possible operators that commute to the Hamiltonian were either the GI or products of the GI. But on a torus, there turn out to be two more operators that commute to the Hamiltonian uh, that you cannot write down as a product of the GI. Uh, and what are those operators? Well, they're called the, I'm going to call them the V operators. There'll be a W operator soon, which will have the usual interpretation. Uh, but the V operator then is the following operator. You take some line, it doesn't matter which line, uh, because the G operator can move it. So you take some line crossing this way, uh, and this over the operator Vx or Vy, and there'll be another operator going this way. Uh, this will be uh, Vx. So what is this thing? So this is some line, I'm gonna call that uh, the curve Cy. Uh, this is the curve Cx. So uh, Vx will be product on L on the curve C, Cx uh, of the sigma x operator. And Vy will be product on L to Cy of the sigma, the same sigma x operator. X and Y here refer to the spatial directions, X and Y. Uh, not the x and y of the of the qubits. They have no connections with each other. Okay. Now, so so one very important thing, if you actually draw the lattice sites, which I feel that I should have done, is that this curve is on the dual lattice. It's not on the original lattice, but it's on the dual lattice. Uh, so let me make that also clear. 
because the L's sit on this curve. So that has to be also be very carefully done. So I'll just draw a straight line, but you can take any shape you want, of course. Uh, well, maybe I don't know. So this is my original lattice. This is my lattice here where the qubits are sitting on the links of the lattice. And the spins, the original spin of the antiparole magnet are sitting on the sides of the lattice. And this curve Cx of Cy uh, is a curve like this, if you look at it more carefully, something like this. So this is Cy and Cx, uh, some other curve. Anywhere you want going and well, eventually it has to come back on itself. It's a closed curve. Uh, this is just a small part of the torus. So this point here uh, has to be identified with this point and this point here. So I haven't drawn it well. <laughs> uh, to be identified with that point. Okay, so now once I've written this down, it's easy for you to check. Uh, that Vx commutes with the Hamiltonian uh, and Vy commutes with the Hamiltonian uh, and the Vx and Vy are not products of any of the GIs. It's really a, an, an extra set of conservation laws, uh, which in fact encapsulate the topological order of the system. Uh, so why does this commute with the Hamiltonian? Well, obviously it commutes with the G term. Why does it commute with the K term? Um, well, just look at the K term on this plaquette. Uh, it crosses this plaquette twice, and those you give a minus sign from each of those, and you get a plus one, so it commutes. And here, of course, it doesn't cross it at all, so again, it commutes, and so on. So it crosses every plaquette twice, or zero times, or an even number of times. And uh, so therefore, it commutes. And it's not the product of G, because the G, remember, were closed loops. The G operators uh, were in this picture, product of sigma X on closed loops. So the G operators, this is a G operator on this side. Right. So you can take the product of the Gs, uh, but because they're closed loops and you go around the whole torus, if you take a whole bunch of them, they will just disappear into nothing. You cannot create an open line with them. All right, so now you have an extra conservation law which commutes with the Hamiltonian. And so you, know, you can ask, uh, you know, uh, the ground state that you're putting on the torus uh, should also uh, uh, be an eigenstate of Vx and Vy. And what are the eigenvalues uh, and what are different states which are eigenstates of Vx and Vy? All right, so from this now you can, uh, no, before I get there. So let me also, to complete the definitions, uh, define another set of operators. Uh, which I'll call, let me only write on Wx. You can do this with a Wy. It's the same thing, uh, product on L, uh, which belongs to a curve, which I'll call, well, what should I call it? C, uh, not C, C, C tilde X of sigma. Z, uh, we can also take the product of sigma z along the x direction. But now this is a line, this c tilde line uh, goes through the direct lattice, not the dual lattice. It's important to shift it, otherwise certain things don't work correctly. So c tilde is something like this. Uh, it's, you know, this is c tilde. This is c tilde x. Okay, and it goes again, uh, it's periodic curve, which comes back to itself. Uh, so there's a C tilde X here. And a C tilde Y, which I won't, won't draw. And these are product of the sigma Z's. Yes. After the GI's along a vertical line, you'll get, you'll get a pair of- uh... Correct, which you can then annihilate with another set, yeah, right. So, but the single VX you cannot get. Right. <laughs> um, all right, so now the WX and WZ uh, do not commute with the Hamiltonian um, because they don't commute with the sigma X term, but they're still very important operators as we see 
uh, when we go to the very low energy subspace. Uh, but it's good to define that. And also we can now write down uh, an algebra of these operators just from the definitions. Uh, you can see that uh, Wx anti-commute with Vy um, and similarly Wy anti-commute uh, with V. Uh, minus. And all the others commute with each other. So why do these anti-commute? Well, if you pick an X curve here, and a, a tilde curve here, sorry, and an untilde curve here, uh, you notice they cross at an odd number of points. They cross only there. So, so for that crossing, uh, you have a sigma Z on the purple line and a sigma X on the green line and the anti-commute. So you pick up a minus one. So this is the algebra of the operators. Uh, so, so roughly speaking, what we have here uh, with these operators is a two qubits. You have two sets of qubits. Uh, one set of qubits is here. These are like the Pauli operators, the anti-commute, the X, WX and VY. And then another set of qubits uh, are the WY and the VX, the anti-commute. And so to get any subspace which are eigenstates of these operators, you need four states. So you have two qubits, uh, and this is the topologically protected subspace in which you want to do quantum computing. You want to use this for quantum computing. So you assume that K is large? Uh, these are just, these are, at the moment, I haven't said anything about K. Because these are all exact statements. Yeah, because the keys, you yeah. can move them around because of the G constraint. Yes. But the Ws, you cannot move them around because you're going to pay a penalty with K. Yeah, so I, I, the Ws don't commute to the Hamiltonian. That's correct. But that, means, the Vs, but that, but that uh, means that you have many Ws and only two Vs. Yes, you're, you're right. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. So I, I, there's a whole set of them, but okay. Well, they will soon start becoming independent of where you put them, but you're absolutely right. At the moment, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> That's in fact probably the better way to stay the next step. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so these are certainly correct definitions, and this these definitions lead to this operator algebra. Okay, so and the reason this is important is because these this operator algebra will tell us something about the, the ground states on the torus. Okay. So certainly at when uh, g goes to zero, that's the limit we're working in. Uh, we can now write down uh, another set of ground states. So I, I, I told you that this was a ground state. Uh, so I told you the ground state, I called it zero, uh, was product on I, uh, one plus GI, the nature sign here, uh, on all spins up. This is again, we're still, sorry, uh, G goes to zero limit. Okay. Uh, but now I can write on in this limit that G goes to zero. Uh, here's another ground state, uh, which let me call it O2. This is O1, uh, which is just Vx acting on O1. Uh, and why is that? Well, uh, because every plaquette, so for the plaquette term, um, sorry, where's the Hamiltonian? <laughs> down here. K sum on this. Um, no, no, wait a second, please. I know, am I doing it right? Sure. Yeah. 
Rest of the I think is that correct? Uh, yeah, okay, so the, the state Vx of zero, uh, yes. So this state, uh, what does it do? Well, if I, uh, if I have some plicket here and the line of V is going through somewhere here. Uh, so I'm flipping this spin and I'm flipping this spin. So on this plicket, I've flipped an even number of spins. And so this term is still optimized. Uh, so it's still an eigenstate of this term. Uh, in fact, it has to be because we experience with the Hamiltonian. Uh, okay. And, and, and so on. Uh, all right. So then I can write down the third one, which is Vx, uh, Vy acting on 0, 1. Uh, and the fourth one, which is Vx, Vy, which is 0, 1. Now, a valid question you can ask, uh, well, are these states orthogonal? Well, you can just see from the every term in the expansion, these states are, are different because it's got a different set of operators flipped. Uh, but a quick way to see this is to also notice that these states are eigenstates of Wx and Wy. So, uh, right. Okay. Yeah, so the, the zero one state, so you can take the operator Wx and Wy, uh, Wx acting on zero one uh, is just zero one because it's just measuring. Uh, okay, this is for eta equals plus one, things might be slightly different for eta equals minus one. So let me not uh, make wrong statements, but you can easily check it's an eigenstate with either, either eigenvalue of plus one or minus one. Uh, because, yeah, okay. Uh, right, okay. So this is again something you can check. Uh, you have to take the product of sigma z along, along this line uh, and see that, uh, well, so the wx, I believe, anti commutes with all of the G, commutes with all of the gi, and, and then it's kind of easy to see when you add wx on the state. Uh, but now this operator, for example, uh, this one, so now you can check that Wx acting on, on 0, 3 uh, is the same as Wx by acting on 0, 3, uh, which is minus by Wx acting on, uh, sorry, 0, 1. Uh, and now this is an eigenstate from this rule. So it gives me minus O3. So this is the proof that these states are actually orthogonal because they have different eigenvalues of, of some other emission operator. Okay. Anyway, so, so at G equals zero, we found four ground states which satisfy the gauge constraints, uh, which are all exactly orthogonal to each other. And they have exactly the same energy. Uh, I may have some of the algebra wrong on the board, but uh, it's relatively easy to check all these statements. So now the natural question becomes, what happens to these degenerate states uh, when G is not zero? Uh, okay, so I have four states. So if I just diagonalize the full Hamiltonian on the torus. Um, so. Yeah, so I'm on a torus. And the spectrum is I have four states here, which have exactly the same energy. Uh, then there's a gap of 2k, because one of the plaquettes has the opposite sign. Uh, and then I have a whole, you know, lots and lots of states there, which I haven't discussed, which we'll probably discuss a bit later. But now we're interested in this, the embedded of the fourfold degeneracy on the torus. Uh, and here are the four states. So what I have to now look at, you know, what's going to happen in perturbation theory to those four states. So I have to degenerate perturbation theory. Um, and therefore I need an operator that's going to take me from one state to other state. Now, if I take the Hamiltonian, so this operator G, so G is non-zero. So if I look at this operator sigma X, each term here at first order in G flips just one bond. And the important point is that these four states differ 
uh, in a global manner. They differ by flipping actually a very large number of bonds. So for example, if I take, yeah, it's useful to forget about these factors and just take this as a representative state. So if I take that as a representative state, uh, then all spins are up. Okay, so the state I begin with is one of the states is all spins up. And the, you know, the perturbation sigma x commutes with the g, so let me not worry about the g. So this is one of the states. But then, for example, the state uh, three, state three has these spins flipped. So these are flipped all the way around the torus. So I want to go from the first state to the third state. Well, how can I do that? Well, first order in perturbation theory, I can only flip one of these back. Second order in perturbation theory, I can flip two of them back. So the smallest order in perturbation theory, which can flip all of these, uh, is going to be uh, of order g to the l, where l is the size of the system. Okay. So there's some effective Hamiltonian here, which describes uh, just this four, these four states, uh, and H effective, uh, you know, the matrix element uh, between say there's the zero one state, H effective, and the zero three state in H effective uh, is going to be of order G over K to the power L, where L is the size of the torus. So I'm going to, you know, there's some hard work to do here. I had to do perturbation theory to order G to the L, uh, not a task I uh, wish upon any student, but in principle, you can do it uh, at order G to the L for a very big torus. And then you're going to find some four by four Hamiltonian, which will have non-zero terms, but all of those terms will be extremely small if G is very small. So then goes to infinity, these are exponentially small. So that's the, the essence of uh, topological order here. But four nearly degenerate states. Uh, there is some splitting, which is computable in this model. I guess in this model, it's perhaps not too hard uh, if you just want the G to the L term. So the minimal order terms will be perfectly straight lines. So you just have to sum over all straight lines. Uh, and then you can put them anywhere you want. So that will probably give you a prefactor of order L, but you know, that's nothing compared to the exponential. Uh, I don't think that pretty much would be the answer. Yeah. Um, so these are extremely small terms. Uh, and now you have these four states, which form uh, a representation uh, of this algebra uh, written over there. So those WX and WY, and WY and VX, WX, WY, VX, VY are a set of poly matrices that act on these four states. Uh, and in fact, I already showed you how that's the case here. So this, this, yeah, this is the algebra right here. Do we really get the factor of L because? Uh, this factor of L? Yeah, because the, the line speed didn't matter where they were located, right? Right, but. Um, well, let's see. The, the transformation that moves the line was that the gauge symmetry? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, so you're connecting one representative against thing. You're right, there's no L here. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the line can wander, but if it wanders, then you get a bigger power of it. So you don't want that. Uh, let's see. When you do perturbation theory, you have to start somewhere along that line. Yes. I think that might be right. You think there is an L? Well, <laughs> okay, I'm confused. Well, I'm uh, really? Uh, uh, let's see. The intuition is that you create a particle, an antiparticle pair somewhere, and travel around the torus. Yes. But, uh, but you know, there's all these other terms here. So yeah, I'm, connect, I'm just picking one of one term of expansion. Uh, and you're, yeah, no, 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 there is an L. So this term of the expansion, will connect to some other term in this expansion. So there'll be one of that, the matrix of it for this one, there'll be another one here, there'll be another one there, and so on. 
I believe there is. Ah, okay, yeah. So the trajectory of the particle is not, it's not. Yeah, I was confusing the B with the trajectory of the particle. Yeah, it has to be straight uh, because if it wanders and the length is larger, and you get a higher power of G. So we're not interested in those. But I believe it has to. Uh, but they could also be things this way, right? Maybe it's us. Too well. Well, that's just a. Yeah, but that's just a prefactor, numerical prefactor. I think it's L. Okay. Yeah. All right. Homework problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I think uh, we've seen that, you know, now you've got this qubit. Uh, you know, this is something the large n theory didn't capture very neatly uh, because all of this is coming from the gauge constraint. And that's associated really with the non zero G effect. Uh, so, in the large n theory, we sort of got a classical qubit. We've got four states. Uh, but what you see now is that it's, uh, uh, you know, you get arbitrary linear combinations of them. It's really a quantum bit. Uh, and uh, which linear combination you have will depend on the details of the lattice and exactly which particular model you're working in. But what you showed is that the splitting in this four by four matrix is exponentially small. Okay, so now let's uh, take the other limit, uh, which is very far from this limit, which is G goes to infinity. Okay. And here, the value of eta makes a big difference, as you see. So this is the confining state. This is a state that the large n theory really knows nothing about because in the large n theory, uh, G was you know, exponentially small. Now we're making it the biggest thing in the problem. So G is going to infinity. All right, so let's consider the two cases separately, A to A equals one. Uh, and see what happens. So in A to equals one, life is very simple. Uh, you know, you just want to diagonalize this. Uh, and clearly there's a very unique state that diagonalizes this with sigma x equals plus one. So let's call it the right state. So now my ground state product on L um, of the spin pointing in the right direction. So this is the eigenstate of sigma x. And sigma x of the left state Minus. Okay, so this is obviously the ground state and has energy uh, minus G times the number of links. So that's great. Uh, and G is large, so that's the unique ground state. Uh, and that's really almost the end of story here uh, because this is also an eigenstate of G sub I. It's an X pointing state, so it just gives you plus one. Gives you plus one times zero. Okay. And we're, that's why we're restricting ourselves to eta equals one. So for eta equals one, life is good. This is the, this is the ground state and you're done. And so there's no sign here of any degeneracy. Uh, and you can also ask what are the quantum numbers of Vx and Vy? Well, Vx acting on this state uh, is uh, uh, um, sorry, Vx acting on this state um, is just just one, and similarly for Vy. Okay. Uh, on the other side, on the other hand, you know, I have these four eigenstates that I wrote down. Uh, those had eigenvalues Vx equals plus or minus one uh, and Vy equals plus or minus one. If you wrote them in the Vx and Vy basis, you would also write them in the Wx and Wy basis and then have eigenvalues uh, plus or minus one in that basis too. Uh, but here the Vx equals plus one uh, and Vy equals plus one state is preferred. So on a torus, there's no degeneracy. So this already this fact establishes that there must be a phase transition. Uh, in one limit, G goes to zero. You had four states with eigenvalues of Vx and Vy plus or minus one. And now 
uh, I have just one state with eigenvalues of both Vx and Uif plus one. Uh, and there's no way that can be continuously connected. So the gap has to close somewhere. Yeah. The fact that you had four states was actually the it's small g. So as you crank g larger, the yeah. state split. How do you know that you don't end up with exact? I know the other argument, but well, so the point. argument is you take the limit L goes to infinity first. So the states don't split. So in the infinite system, there are exactly four degenerate states for all orders in G. <laughs> uh, so of course, in the finite system, you know, there's going to be some funny stuff happening. Here you have one state and uh, some states here, and here four, not nearly degenerate states, with some other stuff here. And there's got to be some funny stuff where three of these levels have to come down uh, somehow. And in fact, all of them come down. In fact, you get a gap with set of states here, uh, which is a conformal field theory, but that's not a better point we'll get talk about later. But we guarantee there has to be some funny thing happening where these excited states, this is G equals infinity, this is G equals zero, um, and the gap in the infinite volume limit has to close at one. Or there could be a first order condition and it doesn't close, but there must be something non analytic as a function of G. So we have a phase transition. Uh, and that's also what Wegner established by, uh, by looking at this area law versus perimeter law in what's called the Wilson loop, which are the WX and WY operators. It's the analog of those, he didn't put it on a torus. They should really be called the Wegner Wilson loops because. Wegner invented them, and the names both start with W anyway. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, so from the Wegner Wilson loops, you can also establish the existence of a phase transition. But this is a much cleaner argument because this argument also works when you have matter fields, you know, the spin ons, which we have integrated out. They destroy Wegner's argument, but they don't destroy this argument. Okay, um, all right, but now how about eta equals minus one? So finally, this is gonna be important. Uh, so let's look at the case eta equals minus one. All right, well, now we're in trouble. Uh, because, well, this is certainly a, a perfectly acceptable low energy state, but GI is plus one, it's not minus one. G has a certain sign, we assume D is positive. So for G is positive, uh, then this is, I'm not getting any state that satisfies the constraint that GI is minus one. Okay, so you can ask well, what are the states which satisfy GI equals minus one? Uh, well, there's got, that's got to be a state which has an odd number of left spins on every site, right? So let me just draw some of these states. Now, in fact, they're going to be an infinite number of ground states. So we're going to find not just uh, a fourfold degeneracy, but an infinite fold degeneracy uh, in the lowest energy states. So here's one, so you know, I want to put the left spin somewhere. So this is the left spin, this is a left spin. Uh, I do this. I'm gonna take every alternate row and make them left. Uh, and everything else uh, is right. So the things I haven't drawn uh, are right, okay? So I don't want to clutter the picture too much. So here's a state. What are the properties of, the, of this state? Uh, so GI is minus one on this state. And the reason it's minus one uh, is because you pick any site, on any site, there's an odd number of left spins. And so there has to be an odd number for GI to be minus one. Okay, so on this side, on this side, on this side, on this side, and so on. Uh, and this is one configuration then, which seems like a valid ground state, uh, for GI equals minus one, uh, for eta equals minus one. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I could have also, for example, taken this state. Uh, 
Um, no, that doesn't work. Remove that. Uh, odd, odd, odd. Well, we'll have to do something here, but okay. I could have taken this state. Now, oh, well, now this one has to go. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, no, really, maybe I put that here. I don't see what's happening up there. So now you can check this is a non minimal state, if you wish, which satisfies this quantity. Uh, it's got odd number here. Uh, well, maybe there's another one here, an odd number here, and an odd number there, and so on. So you can certainly have three ending on a bond, no problem. You figure out some configuration that does that. Uh, but that's not good because every one of these left spin costs you energy 2G. D, remember, is infinity. So that's bad. So you don't want those things. You want the minimal number of left spins. So that there's so the minimal number of left spins, meaning one. Uh, it should be just one left spin per, per, per bond. Okay, so therefore, uh, let me go back to the original state I had. That's one. Okay. And now, of course, I'm sure you can see this is nothing but the set of dimer packings. So for every dimer packing, uh, let's call it a dimer, there is a ground state. So for eta equals minus one, there's a ground state. For every dimer packing, so I have a really an entropy, a ground state entropy here, uh, because the number of states is exponentially large in the system size. So the degeneracy is e to some number times l squared. And that number can be computed as the, how the number of dimer packing scales on a square lattice. Uh, that was actually quite a non-trivial computation way back when. Uh, in the end, it's related to certain uh, Fafian determinants and Fafians of defining other lattice and so on. Uh, anyway, so there's actually this number. We don't really care about it, but there seems to be something really dangerous going on here. But this is actually not, uh, you know, not as uh, scary as the fourfold degeneracy we saw earlier. That was a very robust thing. This one, if every time you see something like this happening, uh, your intuition should tell you that this can't be right. This, we, this means we have to go to put, we have to look at perturbation G and G. It's not enough to just do G goes to infinity. We have to look at the one over G corrections and all probability they will get rid of the center. And in fact, that's what happens here. Okay. So what we find exactly at g equals infinity for eta equals minus one uh, is a ground state entropy and an infinite set of states, uh, each with the same energy. This is very different from the RVB state, which is a linear superposition of all of these. There was only one state, which was the sum of all of these. Now every term in that sum is an eigenstate. So it's very different. So in the end, this is actually quite a difficult problem. Uh, we have to now do one over G perturbation theory, and that's going to give us a Hamiltonian in this subspace of states. I mean, although the subspace is very large, it's still smaller than the original subspace. The original subspace was had a dimension, you know, two to the L squared, or two times two to the L squared, I guess. No, sorry, two to the two L squared. There were two L squared qubits, one for each side of the lattice. Uh, and so I have two to the two L squared degeneracy. This is a much smaller degeneracy, but still it's extensive. Okay, so I've, I've gotten rid of many states by going to dimer packings, uh, but I still have to do further, something better. Okay. So what do I do? What do you get there? Any questions so far? I presume you can hear me because I can't see you online. We can hear you. Okay. All right. So we have to do one over G perturbation theory. So our Hilbert space now. Uh, the Hilbert space you're working with. Um, our states. Uh, well, 
well then D, and D belongs to D, which is the set of dimer packets. That means one dimer for each site. Uh, so I can also rewrite this as, you know, you pick your dimer packing, here's a dimer packing. That's a purpose space. So on these states, these are my states. For every dimer packing, I have a state in my purpose space. On this set of states, I have to define an operator, which will encapsulate the one over G corrections or K over G corrections. So K over G corrections, will give me some effective Hamiltonian, which I call H sub D, acting on these states, oh, acting, acting on this Hilbert space. Okay. And what is this effective Hamiltonian? This is what's called the quantum diver model. So you still have a highly non-trivial problem to solve, which is to diagonalize the quantum diver model. <laughs> uh, so this is some Hamiltonian that acts on the Hilbert space, uh, first proposed by Roxar and Kibbelson. Um, and their motivation was very much the RBB motivation. Of course, you can now see right away that this is every state here corresponds to singlet bonds between the electrons and the original anti magnet. Uh, and furthermore, uh, yeah, and these are all eigenstates of the sigma x operator. So now you see very clearly, very directly that the sigma x is a dimer number operator. So when sigma x equals, uh, has the wrong sign, uh, then uh, sigma x equals minus one now, sorry. I had, a, I made a mistake in my sign. So sigma x equals minus one is when there's a dimer operator. Uh, so the dimer number operator should be uh, I have erased that now. Uh, should be one minus sigma x over two. Yeah. Okay. So when sigma x equals minus one, it's as if I have a diamond there. And I'm forced to put them in. They cost energy, but I'm forced to put them in by the constraint that h i has to be minus one. That's really what made it much more complicated. Yeah. At the other end, we had dimers whether eta was one or minus one. We had them for both, yeah, for both of eta equal plus one and minus one. Previously, now we only have them for eta plus minus one. Correct, yeah. So what this means is that uh, for eta equals plus one, there's a possibility of a trivial ground state. It's the, the state that we had before with all the spins pointing right. In the spin model, that's some trivial state that doesn't break any symmetries or anything. Here it's more subtle, like I'm not getting a trivial ground state uh, for eta equals minus one. It looks pretty hard to determine what we do. Yes, you can. You have to take this quantum diamond model and put it on a computer. So, right. so one possibility is that even at g equals infinity, uh, you get the same state that you had at g equals zero. That's certainly within the realm of possibility that there's no phase, there's no phase. And there is some confining state, uh, but that state has, will break the symmetry. Uh, which I do. Yeah, so that takes a little more work to see. Uh, probably will not get to it today. So HD changes the diamond locally, right? It's yeah, so let me write down the first The first term in this is quite easy to, to work out. What's the effect of K on the diamond model, on these diamond factors? So if I just take a plaquette and just do first order perturbation theory, uh, then you can see what the term is going to be. So I'll take one plaquette, and let's say it has two dimers, uh, one of them here, and the other one has to be there. And it can't be here because then you're, it costs you too much energy. So if I hit this with sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, uh, I'm going to get an off diagonal matrix element, which will be this. They will all be flipped. Uh, and so my dimers, which were initially here, uh, are there. And this is the action of K. So I can immediately write down in a picture uh, what this is. 
the Hamiltonian acting on the diamond, the quantum diagram model is minus k. This is how you write it down. <laughs> it's this term which flips the dimers uh, plus the Hamiltonian quantity. And at higher orders in G, you get uh, other terms. Uh, you know, plus terms. Of, this is about k g to the zero, and there will be terms of order one over g. Uh, so traditionally, the original quantum diagram model of Roxanne and Kibelson, they, they add another term, uh, which is like a v term. This is about one over g. Let me write it down explicitly. Uh, this is not. This is smaller in the large g limit anyway. But who's to say we are interested in the large g limit? Uh, it's basically a potential term. Uh, which is something like this. How much the number of parallel dimers? This one. And similarly for horizontal dimers. So you have some dimer packets and you count how many parallel dimers you have. You have one, two, three. There's no parallel dimers here. And so on. This is a, a diagonal operator, but it gives you some energy scale V. So then you have a parameter here where we that you can now vary and draw some phase diagrams. And there's been an enormous amount of numerical work uh, studying such quantum diagram models. So the question the state of the art of, of the, about the answer here? Is, is there a consensus? On... Uh, it depends on the lattice. It depends on the value of K and B. Yeah, so there is an emerging consensus. So on the square lattice, there's always a broken symmetry. And you get a valence bond solid. These diamonds crystallize in some pattern. Uh, and uh, on the triangle that is, there is some range, small range of parameters uh, of K and V, uh, where it seems like there's still a liquid and there is no, uh, but it's not clear at all whether, uh, you know, that will appear in the G2 gauge theory. In fact, if you take the model of V equals zero, uh, I believe even on the triangle that is, it's confining. You need V to be a certain value before you, you access the. I think that's right. I have to look that up. But yeah. I mean, these are all, you know, in the end, um, you know, we've now two sets of effective models. We started with the spin model, and we got the Z2 gaze theory, and now we've got another one. Uh, We've, neither of them is a particularly accurate, quantitatively accurate description of any realistic system. Uh, so once you get an effective model, you try to understand it on, in, on its own, own right. And there's been a huge amount of work trying to understand this, these type of models. Uh, the general understanding uh, is that if these dino models on a bipartite lattice, they always break a symmetry, uh, which is consistent with the original picture that you got from the spin model. Uh, in the gauge theory computation. Whereas if the dino model on nine ballpark quadrat lattice, they may or may not make the symmetry, it just depends on numbers. Uh, what's or the, there'll what's be... the symmetry break here? Okay, so I haven't I haven't discussed that yet. Uh, yeah. well, to understand this, the simplest way to understand the symmetry breaking uh, is to go back to the symmetric phase, which was the small G limit and look at the excitation spectrum and then ask when is there, is there a confinement trait phase transition and what is the nature of it? So to get a confinement trait phase transition, you have to condense something. So you have this theory of any on condensation it is called. Mostly it's applied for transition between different topological states, but you can also apply it a transition out of a topological state to a confining state. So when you come up with a theory of the any on condensation, you can tell what the symmetry is. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I'm going to go into the details of that. If that's in the notes, how you figure out the symmetry break. But what we are finding here is something, you know, we postulated earlier of two, uh, that if you have spin a half, meaning eta is minus one, uh, then there is no trivial ground state. Either you have a topological state as you have a small g, or you have, uh, a broken symmetry state where the dimers crystallize, uh, which you may get at large G here. On the square diameter, you certainly do get it. Um, yeah, so after time. Okay, so there's a lot to do. I'm 
One is to describe the excited states and any unpleasant condensation condition. And the second is to describe the connection to experiments, which actually I can do now, uh, get started on now, and I'll say more, more next time. Uh, anyway, but let me just complete that thought uh, and tell you uh, what do I mean by broken symmetry. So this, suppose, so here's a dimer co covering. So this dimer covering uh, picks out, uh, you know, the x direction is different from y, so it's broken a rotational symmetry, uh, and uh, and it also picks out every odd row as opposed to every even row. So it has it breaks a certain set of uh, space group symmetries, uh, and this kind of packing. So this thing uh, defines its symmetry defines what we call the valence bond solid or a dimer crystal. I mean, the word valence bond solid is more general because it refers to any spin system. Uh, but in the context of the dimer model, you could also call it a dimer crystal. So you can have your dimers all resonate in a dimer liquid. That's a topological state. Or they can pick out a certain pattern, which doubles the unit cell. Uh, and, and in that pact and that pattern, and that doesn't mean to say that the ground state is exactly this. But the statement is that dimer, pack, dimer configurations with this symmetry are picked out and others with other symmetries are, are, are less dominant. I mean, that's the same as, you know, even in a ferromagnet. Just to say a ferromagnet doesn't mean all spins are up. It means there are more up spins and more down spins. Similarly here, this particular dimer packing is more likely than the other ones. And there are four distinct ground states now, uh, which are, decoupled from each other, uh, associated with the four possible ways you can have this kind of dimer crystal. In fact, for the square lattice, this is the pattern that you see in, in a whole bunch of numerical experiments, uh, and is also the pattern that you predict uh, from these ion condensation theories. Is it number four related to the previous part? No, so this was a, uh, in the history of the of the uh, of spin uh, liquid, this is a point of confusion in the early days. Uh, in fact, there was a paper by Haldane, uh, famous paper, partly related to his Nobel Prize, uh, where he made that misidentification. In fact, so this four is related to the fourfold symmetry of the square lattice. So if I took a rectangular lattice, it would be twofold degenerate, and so on. <laughs> if I took a triangular lattice, it would be six or twelvefold degenerate. So this degeneracy is very much related to symmetry, whereas the degeneracy of the topological state four is true for any lattice with any symmetry. So they're very, very different. So here is the eta equals minus one or the constraint imposed on you from the underlying uh, symmetry of the system that you had uh, exactly one, you know, one spin, spin a half on each side. Um, so the symmetry that is being broken is a symmetry of the lattice. It's not an internal symmetry. It's a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. It's a space group symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Yes. Yeah. It's not a spin rotation symmetry at all. Yeah. These spins have nothing to do, of course, with the other. Right. These are spins. This is just telling you when this spin left means there's a valence bond. It means right there's no valence bond. In terms of the original spin system we started from, yeah. these are forming singlets across the Correct, board. yeah. So there are singlets here. The singlets here. So, you know, so very, you know, pedestrian picture is really every spin can only form one singlet. So in this state, where it's one solid, uh, you know, this, this spin picks the right partner and so on. They pick a partner and that's it. They don't resonate with everybody. Uh, and that breaks the symmetry. All right, I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop here. So I have a question here. So I keep asking you about the role of the underlying SU2 global symmetry for yeah, our, yeah. our story. So here it seems that it is important because you think SU, these are SU2 singlets, right? Uh, right, I mean, if I had started with the original spin model, uh, and, and this particular cycle point was the correct one, 
there's a, you can completely get rid of the SC2 symmetry as long as you have this constraint. I mean, the most important thing is that in the original spin language, the Stringer boson language, uh, on every site, I, I had you know, the Stringer bosons somewhere alpha was equal to one or two S. Um, but I can take any Hamiltonian that's gauge invariant in terms of these S. Uh, but so, then what would happen to this picture here when you couple them to singlets? There's some other entangled states of the two spins. It's not a singlet entangled, it's some other entangled state. It's just, yeah, you can think of it in terms of entanglement. You know, this spin is more likely to be entangled with this one than, than this other four, other three level. Yeah, so it's not exactly that if you have that combination, but something else. <laughs> Uh, the singlet is nice because the SU2 symmetry uh, prefers it, and there's only one, uh, but it could be more complicated. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I think the next step I, is a good point to introduce the Wittberg atoms because the Wittberg atoms are actually literally defined in terms of these, these dimers uh, with, with some twists. Uh, and then you can see uh, different physical context to get. Uh, how you get these uh, topological phases, which are now you know pretty close to being seen experiments. Confirmed that okay. there's some indication already. <laughs> okay, any questions in India? Uh, so there was a question regarding how did you interpret the sigma x states as singlets? Because uh, the sigma x state is on the links and the singlet is made out of the bond I mean, so of the sites. So the singlet is also on the links. So the, the sequence of mappings, if you uh -huh. or, yeah, the, if you you know, I gave a number of different arguments, all can be summarized in this very simple operator connection. So we have, I have the Qs, okay, the Qs, QIJ, which we said in when we decoupled things. Uh, was this operator uh, S, S J beta. So what does this do if I, uh, you know, it annihilates, you know, it annihilates a spin down, you know, this, this operator here, it, it removes a spin down and this removes a spin up on, on neighboring sides. So this, well, this operator uh, annihilates a singlet. Now, you know, in some sense, this seems a little strange because uh, we're just getting rid of the spins. But we know, of course, that if we annihilate a singlet here, uh, we're creating some other singlet somewhere else. Uh, and it's the gauge invariance of the theory that kind of guarantees that we do that. But if I just forget about that for now, then this is the operator which gets rid of a singlet. Uh, and therefore, and when we did the mapping, we identified this operator with sigma z i, uh, l, or i j. So the sigma z lifts lives on the links of the lattice, and it's the singlet annihilation or creation operator. Okay, and so then sigma x, uh, well, okay, so it has to be minus one when there's a singlet, uh, and plus one when there is no singlet. So that's uh, one minus n d over two. Uh, no, the other way around, right? Minus, yeah. So when there's no singlet, no, uh, sorry. Okay, that's not right. The two, one minus two nd. Yes. Okay. So if there's a if there's a singlet, this gives you minus one. If there's no singlet, it gives you plus one. So this is the offered identification between uh, uh, sigma x and whether there's a singlet or not. And this is literally what we just saw. When the spin was pointing left, we put a dimer there. When the spin was pointing right, we didn't put a dimer there. And, and very roughly speaking, you can think of this as something like Q dagger Q. It measures the number of dimers, or ND is something like Q dagger Q, sorry. So, you know, these relations are not to be taken literally. We just trying to get some intuition for uh, what these degrees of freedom are, uh, but hopefully I've sketched, uh, you know, a very solid route to starting systematically from the original antiferromagnet and ending up with this model.
Uh, but what would you interpret the ne negative sigma x state to be? If if sorry, the positive sigma x state to be? Uh, there's no yeah. dimer, right? So you know, so if I have you have a plaquette, if if I have dimers like this, then sigma x equals minus one here, minus one here, plus one here, plus one here. Uh, and if I had it the other way around, then sigma x would be minus one here, minus one here, plus one here, plus one here. But but that would not be a singlet, then, right? I mean, a positive sigma x is not a singlet. Positive sigma x is nothing there. And so, what would it correspond to in terms of the spin operators of the sites? Well, I mean, it's some you have to take the s dot s operator and insist that the expectation of s dot s of this bond is not minus three quarters. I see. Probably one quarter. It's in a triplet state. This yeah, it's a triplet state. So, so yeah. some linear combination of triplet states. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, again, this is a bit approximate because. Uh, even if you, you know, if you took these two states on a square lattice, they're not orthogonal to each other. If you wrote it in terms of the original spins, uh, but this is just a qualitative picture. That's why you have to be very careful about this. Uh, yeah, these are effective models, which have, you know, I've given some, a systematic route to deprive, uh, deriving them. Uh, but, you know, unless you're very careful, sometimes you can make mistakes. And, uh, you know, so it's a complicated history. It all looks very simple and intuitive now, but it was very confusing when these things were being understood. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.